All right, thank you, uh, Anna. So this is your story. This is the origins and the evolution of the cooperative housing in Vermont. Um, and, uh, you know, cooperative housing is a relatively new model to the state. So you are living in the first generation of housing co-ops in Vermont, hopefully the first of many. Um, and this is the largest uh, community of cooperatives in the state that we have here in the in Northwest region. So uh, this story tonight is really about how and why this model was adopted here and also um, how it's adapted over time and evolved because of different funding opportunities and then also challenges over time. And also speaks to what are the organizations that have uh, supported the model over the years, either in service to you as Anna does and Aisha, and also developing co-ops. So it's kind of an evolution uh, through time. I'll give you a sense of how we got to today. Okay. So the housing co-op model here, it came out of um, really the, the Sanders administration in the early 80s. And uh, it is part of really a larger, very progressive and innovative housing agenda that got ushered in starting at that time and continuing it on through the Clavel administration. And the reason for this was that Housing issues in the 80s were, were a big issue. It's a bit like today where it was really one of the main things that got Bernie elected. People in the neighborhoods, renters, you know, community groups um, were really looking for a change where their needs and concerns would be addressed. And uh, Bernie's response to that was really twofold. One was to be sure that his housing policies meant that everybody would have access to housing. But the other characteristic, which is something he carried through his other work was that one of empowerment. That the models, that the solutions the city would come up with wouldn't be top down, <laughs> just government programs, but would be uh, developed with and by the community folks that had really uh, led in advocacy and who needed help. So just a little bit about what were those issues at the time and how might they be a little different from what we face today? Well, one of the big issues looming was the loss of uh, federally subsidized affordable rentals. So that can't happen today in Vermont because we keep everything permanently affordable. But at the time, the program subsidized rental housing for 10 years or 20 years, and then it just went to market. And, and that was what was happening to the people at Northgate as an example. And then because it was the beginning of the Reagan era, it was very clear with the, he just started cutting HUD right away. That was one of the first cuts uh, that there wouldn't be the funds to replace that rental housing. That really we had to find a way to, that there needed to be a way to find, uh, to preserve that housing. Also in Vermont in the 80s, there were no tenant protections of any kind. It's hard to imagine, but that recently there were no protections for renters and that was a big gap. And so combining that with the gentrification that was occurring in the old North End, there was tremendous speculation on the properties in the North End because the waterfront was gonna be developed. And so folks had no protection and people were being kicked out of their apartments. It's all mostly rental in the North End. And also, uh, or the rents would be really jacked up and that was all legal. And so, there was an urgency that was felt um, that had to be responded to. And lastly, in home ownership, not only were prices going up, but it's hard to imagine now, but mortgage rates then were in the double digits. They went as high as 18%. And we've lived mostly in this time of, you know, 5% and less mortgages. And so, you know, it was very hard for people to contemplate becoming um, homeowners and very hard for lower income folks. So those were the issues that we faced. Just want to next slide. And so what was Bernie's response? How is he going to enact some assistance to all these folks that work with them? And the solution really in 1982 was to create a community and economic development office that responded to, to him, CEDO, which exists to this day. And the role of CEDO was to work with 
these community leaders and helped craft solutions for these housing problems. Now, in the community development office, there were three departments, community development, uh, housing and economic development. I was the housing director, the first housing director. Uh, Peter Clavel, who became mayor and later was the CEO director. Michael Monte, who's now the CEO of Champlain Housing Trust, was the community development director. And then Bruce Seifer was economic development. So you can see that our leadership at Champlain Housing Trust was really forged out of this, what we thought of as a large housing movement for progressive and innovative solutions. And um, you'll see, I, I will refer to some of the characters of your history as we go on, because you will see what, what those people are, are doing now and how uh, that commitment to this model and other forms of permanently affordable housing um, have carried forward. And so I was charged particularly to work with these organizations, tenant organizations and Northgate folks and come up with solutions to those problems that I identified. So let's go on to the city's housing policies. So because of this tremendous risk of losing affordable housing, a core principle of Bernie's housing policies was gonna be permanent affordability. The city would only invest in housing that would be permanently affordable and community control. Again, going back to, these needed to be models where people were in the driver's seat. Obviously, co-ops who really, um, uh, really uh, embody that particular goal. So the, the policies carried out were in four areas. We call them the four Ps, to protect vulnerable renters, folks who had no protections in the market, to produce affordable housing that would remain affordable, to promote ownership models that would be available to people that market models didn't work for and co-ops came under that, and then to preserve all this housing perpetually so it remained affordable. And that meant that the city was only going to invest in not-for-profit not housing and in models that had these structures. So, next. And so, the, one of the ways that CEDO's, the main way CEDO carried this out, remember I said they weren't going to be government programs, was to support the creation of not-for-profits not organizations that had community people in their leadership. So in 1984, two of these organizations were created, Burlington Community Land Trust and Lake Champlain Housing Development Corporation. And at that time, the missions were very separate. Burlington Community Land Trust was targeted on protecting people in the Old North End, so whatever that took, and also creating a home ownership model, that shared equity home ownership model that um, BCLP became known for. Lake Champlain, this is a brilliant idea, was created to engage the suburbs in, in rental housing. You know, at that time, only Burlington and Winooski had rental housing, uh, affordable rental housing. South Burlington, you know, Essex, Colchester, these towns didn't have almost no rental housing, let alone affordable. And so a good way to engage them was the creation of this nonprofit that the city supported, seated, and invited the leaders of the other communities. And it was really the first regional uh, housing effort. And again, Lake Champlain was committed, as was BCLT, to permanently affordable um, housing. So it wasn't until, these are the two organizations that would produce housing in Burlington Community Land Trust in the Old North End started uh, intervening in speculation by buying up, the city helped uh, BCLP get funding, buying up properties, rental properties, as they went on the market to protect them from speculators. And um, BCLP had not envisioned really becoming a big landlord, but thought that they'd be able to uh, give people an ownership stake later on. But the first job was just that rescue operation. We'll talk more about that. It's important to your story. And then Lake Champlain was really created to, to build new affordable rental housing in the outlying communities. And then it wasn't until 1990 that the Champlain Valley Mutual Housing Federation was created. And I'll talk about that later. That was the organization 
created to help what was at the time many, many small co-ops come together, pull the reserves, pull their services, have staffing like you have now with, uh, with them and help them with their governance. So that was a, took some time uh, to do. Okay. So next. <clears throat> so when we started, of course, there was not only were there no co-ops in housing co-ops in Vermont, but there was no uh, enabling legislation to create a co-op. And obviously without that legal structure, you can't get financing, you wouldn't have, you know, have people sign leases or anything. So that was a, a big step. But at, in spite of that, this was the sort of vision that people had. The Burlington Community Land Trust, if you look on the right of the slide, in their very earliest work plan in 1985 said that the, the VCL team would offer the co-op option to all that rental housing it was buying in the old North End. And so that the residents would have the option of ownership once they came into the trust. And that was the vision that carried VCLT through those acquisitions. And in the meantime, they were just managing these, these properties. And then wait, if you could go back and ask, sorry. And then also the city continued to support sort of the development of capacity. There's not much understanding, no, no models to look at in Vermont. And the city sent Mike Monty, um, who was community development director and myself up to Montreal to visit the Milton um, Park Co-op. And Milton Park was the closest co closest co-op we could visit. But it was also a very interesting model for us because what Milton Park did is they actually bought up the neighborhood of uh, McGill University. And so in their co-op, the common thing was owning the land were co-ops, condominiums, um, and special needs housing, uh, and shelter. So they had every kind of housing on the land and it was all organized and it was like a co-op of co-ops. We thought that was also good for our visioning of VCLT's work, um, but certainly the closest co-op that we could visit. Okay. Then in 1985, uh, the city created the Burlington Housing Task Force, and this was an effort to bring community stakeholders into this vision that we were developing at CEDO of this innovative progressive housing policy. There were 16 recommendations, most of which have since gotten passed. It included things like advocating for landlord tenant law at the state, uh, creating the Burlington Housing Trust Fund, which only funds permanently affordable housing and so on. But number eight in the city's plan was endorse the adoption of state enabling legislation to encourage and facilitate the development of housing cooperatives. Now, the funding of housing cooperatives was also stated as a priority for the city's funding, community development funding, state funding, any funds that the city got. So the city made its commitment even before there was enabling legislation, just as did Burlington Community Land Trust. So before we go a little further with your the story, I thought it'd be a good moment to pause and talk about this, you know, the importance of the co-op and housing options at the time by comparing it to others. And obviously a, a prime comparison would be a condominium development because condominiums also provide ownership in a multifamily setting, right? It's a way to collectively own some stuff and give individual ownership. And the condominium enabling legislation had only recently been passed in Vermont in the late 70s. And so it was still a new model itself and mostly used you know, in the urban area around Burlington, wasn't rural. But in a condominium structure, there's a condominium association that owns all of the common area, you know, the land, the infrastructure under the land, but each, buy, each owner in the condominium has to get a mortgage to buy their unit. So even though it's a more affordable form of ownership, it didn't serve all our position of a, having an alternative because you had to get a mortgage. Remember, mortgage rates were high. And when you mortgage in a condominium, you own everything inside your walls, inside your own walls. And then you pay um, your condominium association fees to help cover all the operating costs, you know, of mowing and plowing and 
so on operating insurance. But the other thing that, that creates a barrier for many people in a condominium association is that if a large capital improvement need arises that you had not anticipated with your, op with your reserves, then you assess every homeowner for the share of the cost. So if you have 25 condominiums, homes, and then you have a $100,000 job, everybody has to come up with $4,000 at the moment. And so we realized that wasn't going to be fully, uh, it's one option in the spectrum of ownership, but not ideal. So let's look at how a co-op would differ. So Anne, we could go, oh, to the, uh, this is the condominium structure. I thought that was up. I'm sorry. I'm looking at my notes. So you can see in the condo uh, what I just described. It's really the common areas only that you govern. The other thing that is like a co-op is you have a board of directors and you could serve on your board and that, that operates the co-op, the condo, I'm sorry. So now let's go on to housing co-ops are a little different. In a housing co-op with enabling legislation, you can form a housing co-op corporation. It's the entity and the, that corporation can get a mortgage. It's called a blanket mortgage for the entire property, buildings and land. And then when someone moves into a co-op, this is just as you do it today. The, the person moving in signs a lease and gets a share in the co-op. And that share entitles you also to serve on the board, right? And then the carrying charges that you're charged cover the operating costs as well as paying down any financing or any mortgage. This I'm going to tell you is the conventional housing co-op model. And I'll give you two, there's two types of these. One is a limited equity housing co-op model and the other is a full equity. So in many cities like New York, you can buy into a co-op and as you pay your carrying charges, you're assessed with paying down a share of that mortgage the co-op has. And when you sell, they have to pay you out that equity, okay? And so in the full equity co-op, co-ops get very expensive. And the next person moving in has to come up with that down payment of equity to move in. So you can move into a co-op in New York now and you have to come up with $2 million or $3 million. In a limited equity co-op, you have the same structure, but just like in the BCLT shared appreciation homeownership program, people are paying down the mortgage and that gets assessed to them but it's capped, it's capped to remain affordable. So you know you're gonna get a limited return. And then when you leave, you get that limited pay down and someone that can buy in for less. So that is the traditional structure. And that's the way we'll come back to this Flint Avenue co-op was uh, organized as a limited equity co-op. Okay, so the city was continued on. Um, the legislation was not yet passed in 1986. Um, the city of Burlington sent two folks to the National Co-op Housing Conference in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And there are many, many co-ops in Madison. So while it was further away, it was good to be able to look at an American model and go to this conference and gain skills. And this was all in anticipation on the city's part in being able to promote enabling legislation here in Vermont. And I wanna introduce these two characters that some of you will know, some of them. Uh, Amy Wright succeeded me as the housing director at CEDO and later uh, went to work for Lake Champlain Housing Development Corporation and became their project developer. And because she gained that expertise in multifamily development, she in fact was a project developer for Flint Avenue Co-op, for um, uh, Selma Maple, and for Queensbury. And I know she's helped some of you with your refinances. So again, someone who stayed pretty committed to this model. Earhart Monica, he was working uh, in the community development office for the city of Winooski and was also very committed to giving the uh, renters he was uh, helping there to purchase to become uh, co-ops, uh, cooperators. But Earhart lived in Burlington and was on the Burlington City Council. And he was a strong advocate for this entire progressive housing agenda and co-ops in particular. And Earhart and I shared a little background in that in that he also came from a country where co-ops are common, uh, Germany. And I grew up in uh, Canada. 
co-ops are very common there. My sister lived in a co-op. It was sort of an affordable model. So we really uh, were strong advocates and saw the practical benefits from experience. So they were sent off and they came back and Earhart became a very, very strong leader in working on the legislation. So we'll go to the next slide. And Amy worked more in development. So in 1987, Vermont finally passed the Housing Co-op Enabling Legislation. And again, I wanted you to meet some of the folks who have been part of the movement. So at that time, I was at the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And I went there because the job was to lead their legislative agenda, which included co-op legislation, the landlord-tenant law, and the creation of the state's housing trust fund, Vermont Housing Conservation Board. That was really fun. And then for the city of Winooski and with Burlington Advocates, Earhart worked on the housing call legislation. I worked on it. And then next to Earhart going to the right is John Davis, who actually moved to Burlington to help us create Burlington Community Land Trust. And he was our sort of housing you know, genius guy. He had a doctorate in planning and knew all these models and was very progressive. And he succeeded Amy at CETO as the housing director. So staying in the tradition of progressive housing folks. And I have to tell you, I put this picture of him because his daughter, Dia, she doesn't work in this kind of work. What Dia does is she uh, is a, a forest fire fighter out in Idaho. And she is one of the, the firefighters that is trained to repel down out of air, uh, helicopters to fight the fire and she's the only woman in her crew and so she's got her own way of saving the world it's really incredible um and then on the right nancy eldridge was the we were so lucky nancy was the housing commissioner for the state and she worked in the administration the governor was madeline kuhn and also pretty progressive and um nancy went on to lead the Cathedral Square Housing Corporation for the elderly. But at that time, she was an advocate for this because Nancy had worked in uh, Somerville, Massachusetts, and they had a tremendous program of helping tenants to buy their buildings and co opt them. So I was, uh, we were at Burlington Community, just really looking to her and her experience. So she was a great advocate. So having this leadership from key cities, the finance agency and the administration were able to get that legislation passed on the first try in 1987. By the way, that's also the year that the comprehensive landlord tenant law with protections for tenants was passed. So it was a very good year um, for progressive housing in Vermont that year. So having now in place uh, some housing stock that Burlington Community Land Trust, if you look at the lab, bottom row of these boxes, had been developing in, in the Old North End that Winooski was developing with their stock and there were student co-ops and the passage of enabling legislation. The city helped support the creation now of the Champlain Valley Mutual Housing Federation. The federation was organized this way. It was a board of directors made up of members from all these small co-ops. They could serve on this board and the point of this was each small co-op really you know couldn't afford capacity but together they could have staff to support their governance as what anna does with you and also uh do some things like pool their reserves and share with each other and so it was a model that brought these tiny co-ops now some of these buildings only had three units in them so if you're in that co-op you're always working it's not like you sometimes you're on the board sometimes you're not right everybody had to work on their co-op and and then could also be represented in the mutual in the federation and bring sort of more resource and support so that was a really a gain uh, for the co-ops and it was time now to be able to start really developing new co-ops. And we'll look at that in the next slide. So it was in the early 90s when uh, John's uh, washing machine was installed, his dishwasher. But in the uh, 1991, the Flint Avenue Co-op was created as a limited equity co-op with 28 uh, homes and I believe Jane, who's on this in the training, was a founder there um, at the beginning. And um, 
But wait a minute, did you say I was there from the beginning? I, I wasn't. I, I came there three years after. On, okay, on thanks, Jane. Pretty close, yeah. though. Pretty close. Pretty it close. Just is, yeah, and just as dedicated as the founders. And so the opportunity with new funding um, was that you know more new construction co-ops could be built. And we knew with the small co-ops how hard it was for people to do all that governance, but we could see the opportunity now also to build new. And remember in that earlier slide, Burlington Community Land Trust, the Lake Champlain House of Development, both had development capacity uh, to develop these properties. So we'll just go to the next slide. So this important um, development, which was really in the early 90s, is a very important to your story and how the, the your co-op model has evolved itself. So as I noted earlier, Flint Avenue Co-op was developed as a limited housing, a limited equity cooperative, and they got a blanket mortgage, and it took an enormous amount of special subsidy, which I will credit uh, Senator Leahy got that project to be able to make it work. But in fact, the affordable housing programs of the time, none of them were, were um, really available to do that. So that was very difficult. But in 1991, a new program became available called the, you'll all be familiar with this, Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. And instead of subsidizing housing directly, of course, um, this, Create, this is a model that uses the tax code to create affordable equity for affordable housing. I will just say to you now, editorial comment, it's a really stupid way to fund affordable housing. It adds a lot of costs, a lot of complexity. However, it is the, the program that exists and it does create a lot of very affordable capital for production. And so you use what you have. And so I wanted to explain how that program works first, because you know that this program is also used to create co-ops. So let's just look at it quickly to understand that underlying complexity. Um, each project is its own limited partnership, its own entity, its own partnership. And that's right there, a layer of complexity, but anyway. And the partnership is comprised of two kinds of partners. One are limited partners, the other is the managing general partners. Let's start with the limited partners on your left, that big bag of money, because the limited partners are the investors. And in Vermont, uh, the investors are mostly banks. And they do this because it's part of their uh, banking good work called community reinvestment. And it's a good deal. And uh, what the limited partners do is they put money in and it's equity and it creates it really funds about 60% of any projects. That's a huge amount of money because it comes to us, the nonprofit managing their own partner, like a grant, because instead of having to pay it back, what the investors get is a tax benefit on their corporate wealth for 10 years. So the managing general part, the investors are putting in money. They're the 99% owners, but they have nothing to do with the property and they earn tax benefit for the investment. That's them. The managing general partner is the nonprofit. And this I'll use the Champlain Housing Trust as an example. We have lots of these partnerships now. And the job of the managing general partner is to operate the property as if we owned it, even though it's a 1% ownership in, in the legal structure. And that means that the nonprofit manages the property provides maintenance to the property, does all the compliance, because there's all these regulations that go with it, as you know, and affordability requirements, and that's why you have to certify your income every year and all of that. And also has to look forward to protecting and preserving the asset over time by addressing its capital needs. And that management role for you all is, is done by Aisha and, and also by it has been done by Jacinta. So this is a structure now of financing that had to be used to create co-ops if we were gonna create co-ops that were affordable. And so what does this mean for the co-op? And we can just move on to the next slide, Anna. Okay, so how did we were able to take this rental money and put it into a project that provide 
a, a co-op structure. And this is how it's done. Okay, so first the tax credit partnership is created. It's a limited partnership. And the, the partnership master lease, as it's called, the master lease of rights to this co-op corporation. So just as in a conventional co-op, the co-op creates a corporation, but instead of having this direct ownership, even a nonprofit doesn't really have direct ownership, it has this master lease relationship that gives the rights of the control that you all have in the co-ops. That's where that is done. And so the co-op then hires the managing general partner in the nonprofit to do that maintenance but, and, and uh, property management maintenance, but also contracts for the governance services uh, that support your governance as boards of directors and members of the co-op. So all, one thing about this model is all these entities, but all the parties are committed to the use that's restricted by the IRS of assurance affordability. And in Vermont here, by being in a nonprofit, like Shepherd Housing Trust, that's a commitment to permanent affordability. So the we all have, the thing that's important is now we're all in these different entities and have different roles, but there's such a commonality of mission and purpose. And that should not be lost in understanding. We are really all rowing in the same direction in these different roles. And and frankly, you're very sophisticated. Uh, uh, leaders of your corporations because it is a complex business. Can we go to the next slide? This is my place. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm hoarse. So having this change of structure was not the only change that we found in the 90s for the development of the co-ops. Um, as you can see, we had to adapt the funding to this tax credit program. So it did create some limits uh, by creating a zero equity co-op instead of a limited equity co-op. But it also brought a much higher level of affordability and a lot more capital. You know, the original, uh, the co-ops that developed from you know, the little rental developments in the old North End and Winooski, this was old housing stock. These were old buildings. It's much harder for the co-op members, you know, to manage those buildings and foresee all the capital improvements with us and so on. So the, the ability to create these lovely new apartments and make them very affordable as co-ops is certainly something worth stretching to. But the um, small co-ops were, for the reasons I just described, we're really struggling and having challenges in the 90s uh, with maintaining these assets. And it was also harder and harder for organizations to get funding. You know, all three nonprofits, the Federation and the two development nonprofits, we all had different missions and very important reasons to be different organizations and we're all adding value. However, we all had to compete for the same shrinking pool of funds. It was not the you know, high support from the federal government for nonprofit development. And so we all were just facing challenges. And the small co-ops needed a lot more support and different resources than they could afford to support. So the small co-ops uh, started merging into, we were trying to combine them into bigger projects of BCLT so that they would at least have a little bit of scale, but it was still a, a difficulty. The other difficulty that arose, and this was really one that was particular to Flynn, was that it was in the 90s that they started having these zero uh, more down payment mortgages. Remember the, the go-go 90s for all these mortgage instruments, pushing people into home ownership. And so people could actually buy a home without a down payment. Whereas Flynn Avenue, even though it was limited equity and the down payments were pretty affordable, small, you know, it was hard to compete with a zero down payment. So Flynn started looking at, should they really be paying out as much equity through their model and, and eventually adapted their uh, formula for the future, not to the existing co-ops who've been building it, members who've been building equity. Uh, in order to be more like the zero equity co-op. So that was just a question again of affordability 
and access. So as a result of that study, the Mutual Housing Federation realized that it could not go it alone anymore and support the small co-ops, and that it should look for a partner a home for its programs. And it, uh, the group looked at different organizations, and Burlington Community Land Trust put our hands up because, you know, again, co-ops had been central to our mission from day one. And the Federation Board chose BCLT, and so they sort of merged into BCLT, and that's why there's now a, there's a seat on our board just for co-ops. There actually could be two co-op members in the resident seats. Right now there's one. Um, and BCLT sort of dove into helping the small co-ops uh, have solutions. And I'll talk about that a little more in the next slide. But some of the exciting developments was that Lake Champlain development developed the Queensbury and Burlington Community Land just developed Rose Street. So we had some new co-ops coming online with these new uh, tax credit programs. And some of our small co-ops started exploring returning to rentals and realized it would be a lot less work for them to just have a mission-driven landlord in BCLT rather than this. Um, and we started to work on that. The other exciting thing was we saw that larger co-ops would have a better shot, you know, because of the scale and people didn't have to serve on the board all the time and, you know, just the scale of, of numbers for affordability. And we, uh, BCLT purchased the Park Place building downtown because it had had a fire and we and saw that that would be 31 apartments. So that would have been the biggest co-op by far and developed, redeveloped that building as a co-op of 31 apartments. So that was 1999. So what happened uh, is most of, pretty much in the end, almost all of our small co-ops opted to go back to rental. The Burlington Community Land Trust really dove into that work with them. Each co-op had to take their own vote. And then we worked with them through a legal process. And then we worked to create to raise the capital to improve those buildings and put them together uh, into larger <clears throat> projects, which was all accomplished within many years. But again, BCLT was committed to the folks who live there. It was part of the mission and also the commitment that people had chosen that option and if they chose another option, you gotta be there and preserve their home. So that took time, but that worked out. And by 2000, almost all of them had become <coughs> rental in Winooski and the Old North End. But here are the interesting outliers. Um, Park Place was our biggest co-op at the time. It's the only large co-op to ever opt to go back to rental. So each of those members voted unanimously to go back to being rental. So we operate it today as a rental. And then House of Hildegard is the only small co-op. It's in the Old North End. It's really a lovely building. They still operate their co-op together and never went back to being mental. So that's the only one of those that survived. And again, the staff uh, supports that and supports their work. So having a shifted over to this new model to get the, the affordability and the deep funding, you know, there are some trade-offs with being a limited equity co-op, the main one being that being able to build build up some wealth in the uh, co-ops uh, mortgage. So it's, we thought we should take a moment and look at what are the benefits though, being in the kind of co-op that most of you are in. And these are really the main things that you have to stay over. In the tax credit co-ops, the co-op corporation still has control over the budget and is staying in the carrying charges uh, and maintaining that affordability. And I can tell you that all of the co-ops have more affordable charges than the buildings that are only in rental. And that's because of the labor that you also put in uh, and, and make it, to make those stay affordable. The co-ops folks can do improvements. You can do improvements to your units, which is not permitted in the rentals. All the co-ops, people can have pets and not all of our rentals have that. It's increasingly, we have shifted over to that, but that's a more recent thing. And then very importantly is the input 
that you all have in your capital improvements in the five-year plan and making priorities within what has to be done over the life of the building and choosing what vendors you want to work with. You have, of course, a big say in how things are managed and control over the policies and the rules and these different co-op to co-op, not only between co-ops and our rentals. And then in a co-op, folks, you have these opportunities to attend trainings and gain skills and have personal growth. I will say, I always say the folks in co-ops are gaining business skills. You operate quite complex businesses, big ones and also civic skills. At one point, there were three residents of BCLP homes on the Burlington City Council at once. And one of them was a BCLP homeowner and two were co-op residents. So I'd say that shows a high level of civic capacity there. And then most people, and this is what people choose it for, is to have a greater sense of community and engage with your neighbors and do things more together and build that community um, together. So a lot of change over those years. And, and that what started out as these many organizations with common commonalities in the big picture mission, all coming together and to become a, one organization. First, that merger of BCLT and the Federation. And then in 2006, uh, Lake Champlain and Burlington Community and Land Trust merged. And so all the co-ops are now with CHT in our portfolio. And we have this relationship together with you uh, to, in, in the management of the co-ops. An exciting development though, uh, after this kind of consolidation and settling out was being able to create Bright Street Co-op, our biggest co-op ever of 40 homes. And really that showed us at that time, it kind of ushered in what I call a new era of co-op development, the ability to do bigger properties, which we, we really work hard to do on the rental side as well, because there is a cost efficiency and more sustainability, you know, it's a greener way to develop. But also that we're seeing a new market where more people, again, are looking at, uh, we're not looking to get a mortgage to buy a home, but we want to, have more security of tenure than renters. We want to have more community. We want to know where we live. So we hope that Bright Street is just um, the beginning of a new era of uh, being able to develop larger co-ops and bring this option to more folks. And then the other thing I want to say about us all uh, coming together is that with this complexity of of uh, structuring deals, and we all do have different roles, but I think. You know, our history shows how much there's a common purpose and a common movement of progressive housing that led to the development of co-ops and, and actually led to the sort of uh, an evolution by necessity to preserve this option for folks and to keep working on making it better. And co-ops have been in our DNA from the earliest days as a CFBCLT, but I can truly say, having been around for a while, that we never had the kind of capacity that we have now to serve co-ops. You know, in addition to Anna and Aisha, you know, our senior property manager, Jacinta, is a co-op expert. And we're building that expertise in our capital needs team, our asset management and maintenance. So it's something that will always be at the heart of CHP's mission and kind of a core program, even though it's not the largest, that doesn't matter. It's the importance of having this option amongst other options for people. And so I've talked a lot about different leaders and folks, and I wanted to end with your own leaders. These are two uh, women, sadly, have gone before us, but both are uh, emblematic, I think, of the leadership that's made our co-ops with what you are. Um, on the right is Carol Pack, who was on the board of uh, Thelma Maple Co-op, worked in Thelma Maple Co-op, and then was on the board of BCLP at that crucial time when we first came together and really played an enormously important role. And was a hardworking volunteer, and we have named our volunteer award after Carol. And so she's remembered every year at annual meetings, we give that award to a volunteer. 
And on the left is Marsha Mason, who's a founding member of Flynn and always a very outspoken advocate for co-ops and for affordable housing, very active in the community. And Marsh is famous for saying at every co-op, I mean, there were many years, you know, when we were solving all the small co-ops and stuff where we didn't develop a new co-op. Marsh at every annual meeting would say, when are you going to develop a new, another uh, co-op? And now, even though she's gone, a board member always puts up their hand and says, in honor of Marsha, we want to know when you're going to build another co-op. And so they're really uh, great representatives of, uh, of these communities. And that ends my presentation. Thanks, Brenda. You're welcome, Anna. So at this point, we can kind of open it up to any questions you all have. If any. No. All right, going once. I appreciate the, the uh, presentation, Brenda. I think you did a, a good job over a really kind of, I don't know what call them complex, but it is a complicated, you know, system sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, to get from A to B or A to E or, or whatever. And um, yeah, a good presentation. And uh, obviously you've done a wonderful job. So <laughs> we appreciate that. Well, it was clear as mud, as they say. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was good. Brenda, I do have a quick question, um, and I bet, you know, a lot of folks here can relate, especially those that have lived in the co-ops for a while and have seen, you know, things change, people come and go. Um, any, you know, words of, I guess, wisdom for folks that do get burnt out, who have lived there for a while, have went through all of these changes and fluctuations, um, you know, really how how do they stay invested, right? How do we keep morale up um, among everybody, uh, even in stressful times like now? I don't know if you've, you know, had to kind of go through some, I'm sure some hard periods with co-ops where there's a lot of conflict and things like that. So what are the outcome, you know? What is the, what is the end goal? Well, you know, the, there's a lot packed into that, but I think you're right that you know what, I always say one of the reasons I'm so, I'm personally very committed to cooperative living and I've worked with different co-op communities in the earlier days as some of the two uh, difficulties and, and conflict and stress. And I just admire people so much because we all say we live in a democracy and every four years we go out and vote, right? Or two years of the vote. But when you live in a cooperative, you live your democracy and you live it with your neighbors. And if you have disagreements, it's your neighbor and your friends. And I understand that those things, you feel them more deeply. So I think what is important, and there's no way around that really, but to be able sometimes to step back as we're doing here a little bit tonight and remember why it's important, why it's valuable. One of the things, again, that I've admired in the co-ops whenever there's been challenges, one of the things, or opportunities, you know, it's like refinances. The first thing that people commit to is, we don't want anybody to lose their housing. We want our housing to be affordable. And that commitment to each other, it doesn't mean that in the moment there is a difficult time, but you can, you know, just remember the purpose and the reason, and remember to put your hand up and ask for help. You know, nobody's a miracle worker and nobody can wipe out the hard feelings that can come with this or hard decisions that we have to make. You know, it's, we struggle with that, but know that you have resources and that that's one of the things I want to emphasize in this. It looks like to some people, like we're just a business serving you because we have a contract for services. But no, this comes out of a deeply shared commitment to a different way of doing housing, not being like the real estate market, not just being there to, for everybody who can uh, you know, we can pay the most money. It's not about that. And it's much harder to say, we're going to commit through hard times and through difficulties to stick together. So I think you have to support each other to be able to take the breaks you need, spell each other, don't let some people always be on the board. And, you know, it might be hard to step up, but if it's shared and you can balance that, that can help. 
And the one thing, other thing I want to add when I say ask for help is, you know, even though we have to we're, operate very businesslike, as you know, um, when the co-ops have reached a bump in their capital needs, many, almost every co-op now, not Bright Street, but, you know, we go out and get grants. We don't just say, well, raise your parent charges and finance. You know, if we can get a grant, we move heaven and earth. And I know at the LT and then Champlain Housing, many costs when you hit that bump where the costs would have been great. And, you know, get the funders online and go and beat them up and getting any rights, go and beat them up. We have a lot of allies. Just remember that in, in your costs. Have a lot of allies to have them use them. And remember that just because we're different entities, it doesn't have to be adversarial or think of us as being uh, all separate in our separate worlds, but that we, we're there to help each other. Um, there's one thing that reminded me, and, and then a, a suggestion I'll make for co-ops, if you ever go through a rough patch and you wanna consider this, we have found that on community boards, which I work with a lot and I'm doing more in this work, it, you can always choose to add some community reps to your board. And that can, so that first it shares the load on your board, but also if there's someone there who doesn't live there, who doesn't have that same you know, emotional connection or that they can help uh, sort of mediate and be another voice and perspective. They can see all sides and not be vested in the same way. So if you live there, that's not an answer for everybody, but that might just be one way when you talk about Alicia lifting some of the weight you all carry for your properties and you know that there might be some way to get some help there. No, I thought that was a great answer. Like just really keeping in mind the the mission, the bigger picture is, you know, what gets us even through our day to day on some of the tough days. So thank you. So I would I would just add that um in the legal document updates you guys all just passed, um, I think all, if not most of the co-ops added a provision in your bylaws that says that if um, you feel there is a community member that can bring some expertise to the board, um, then the board can vote to welcome on a community member. So, um, and Rose Street is actually going through that process right now, so. Interesting, good. John, did you have your hand up? I did. So um, to, I'm sure we've talked about this at the CHT board from time to time, but uh, to echo Marsha Mason, um, What's the latest on our next possible co-op location and size and timing? Any information or insight on that? I don't at this time. Um, I think with the COVID going on so long, our development pipeline got very focused on creating that housing for folks coming out of homelessness and those kinds of purchases and it's kind of taken up all the, the capacity in the short term. But I encourage, especially on you on the board and the call members to ask the question on the board. There's a, always a long-term pipeline out there and where might be a good low, you know, a good property that could lend itself to being co-op and not just rental, you know, in the longer term. So it's always a possibility because as you see now, they are structured and financed with the same resources. That's what we have to use. We're also very hopeful, I will say, with the new administration in Washington, and this is something our national network works on very hard, that there's a much greater understanding in this administration of permanently affordable housing models and nonprofits and alternatives to the market. And we're hoping that there will be more funding that will give us more options to, um, you know, to be able to fund things and keep it simple, maybe. Jane? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know you've taken the taken. Uh, we, I guess we we you took you took the Canadian model as the um, as as for 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 developing that the for co the, the co ops. Have you and um have has have you looked to the to the um to the to to to, to the cooperative housing movement in the United States? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, very and, much. And, and, and have you made connect, con, some, 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 some connections with that? And also, I wanted to add, Richard Kemp was another person who would ask at, ask, ask at need, ask at, um, at the annual meetings about about developing co-ops. It wasn't just Marsha. 
that's true. Thank you for remembering Richard. He's uh, still with us, but uh, uh, having some health issues. So um, yeah, we didn't, I wouldn't say we took the Canadian model. We just kind of took inspiration by seeing a working co-op, you know, working community of co-ops, which you couldn't visit here. You know, you're the, you're the point of this plan. You were the first generation. And so it was fun to just go and visit a co-op closely. And I, like I said, I sort of had that faith in it from uh, experience, but and to see that people could make it work. And in every state, property law is different in every state. So in every state, there'll be little differences in structuring and real estate, and that applies to co-ops too. But we had good ties with the national movement, the national co-op student movement. And in the early days when we were able to get that kind of financing, but it was very difficult and costly. We did get some financing from those national co-op organizations. So yeah. And in the, our national network, uh, Champlain Housing Trust is a member uh, of the Grounded Solutions National Network, and I'm on the board. And that's a network of, um, of community land trusts, but much of the portfolio in the big cities are affordable co-ops like yours. And San Francisco has a lot of them. If you're ever out there and you want to visit them, if you have family out there or something, we could always hook you up to visit co-ops in other states. So there are a few states where uh, the model is, is really uh, more broadly used in California swimming. Yeah. Now, are they, uh, do they have co op co-ops as small as ours? Because I know that New York has some large co-ops. In fact, my brother lives in a housing co-op with several, with hundreds of units yeah. in it. Yeah, that's a more urban model, certainly. Yeah. Um, but no, some of the co-ops in San Francisco, some of the co-ops are quite small and they're organized into a sort of a federation through the trust, through their housing trust. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Rick, you're silent. Um, I, well, I said as much in the chat because I was having technical issues, but uh, I just wanted to say to Brenda, thanks to you and, and everyone you've mentioned in this presentation for all you've done to provide affordable housing to us and all our predecessors and those to come. When, uh, before going to St. Michael's, I was living in Manhattan for a year. And back in 89 in Manhattan, we were paying, I think, nine twenty-five for a one-bedroom apartment in Hell's Kitchen. And that was, you know, I, and I, the fact that I'm only all these years later paying, you know, a couple hundred more than that for a two-bedroom in this wonderful city is pretty amazing. And, uh, yeah, so. Thanks. Thank you. There are a lot of people. Like I said, you have a lot of allies out there. Very committed folks. Was there anything else in the chat, Anna? Because I wasn't looking at nope, that. No, that was the only one. All right. All right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, I just wanted to say thank you all for, for coming. And you know we're always here if you think of questions after this wraps up. Um, you know, Aisha and I can always answer a lot of those, but we can always, we still have Brenda. Um, even though she's not CEO at CHT anymore, she's still very close by and just an email away. So we can always reach out to her. Um, so I guess I will let everyone go. Good night. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Thank Bye you. everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.